Today I'm here to speak to you about our recent excavations at Pitskelly Farm, Carnoustie, Angus, on behalf of DG Lane. Set in a rich archaeological landscape, Carnoustie has been home to several important discoveries through developer-led excavations, and this site certainly sits amongst them. We are still at the early stages of our post-excavation progress, and so today I will mainly be setting out the outline of what we have discovered and our future research aims. And this will hopefully inform us of our of the early Bronze Age burial practices. As I mentioned, Carnoustie and indeed Angus sits in a rich archaeological landscape. In the surrounding area, there are hundreds of years worth of agricultural and settlement activity. Decades worth of aerial photography has shown enclosure systems and possible settlement through crop marks. Immediately to the south of our excavations, a now descheduled area has shown crop mark and geophysical evidence of a possible prehistoric settlement, along with pit alignment, possible kiln or oven, and with other discrete pit features. To the east of the development lies Pit Skelly enclosure, which has been interpreted as a settlement possibly dating between 1800 BC and AD 400. And excavations along at Clay Hills further east identified three phases of prehistoric activity when an enclosure with internal features and a spread of a further 78 pits were excavated. And recent evidence from Guard archaeology at, to the east at David Moyes Road has found two Neolithic timber halls, as well as Bronze Age settlement activity, and uncovered a Bronze Age hoard, including a spearhead and sword. So far, no early historic activity has been identified within the, this area. However, some of the aforementioned crop crop marks could in fact be early historic rather than prehistoric. And a wealth of post-medieval agricultural activity has been recorded in the area. In Carnoustie itself, excavations by the CFA have uncovered post-medieval field systems, and Pitt Skelly itself first appears in the 1662-5 Shire of Angus maps. The site of Pitt Skelly Farm is located to the east of the main town near the Barry area, consisting of relatively flat agricultural land. The site had a simple uh, stratigraphy of topsoil overlaying natural beach sand uh, to depths of a metre total. The site had previously been raised beachhead in the distant past. When planning was submitted for a large housing development, given the previously undeveloped land, the known area of crop marks to the south and recent discoveries in the area, an evaluation that led to a subsequent excavation was commissioned by the developer. Before discussing the obvious main event of the site, I shall quickly describe a selection of the features uncovered during the excavation. The site can generally be characterised as a multi-period farming and settlement site. To the very south of our area, a large Neolithic waste pit was uncovered with a large fragment of cooking vessel measuring 3.1 metres in diameter by 0.75 metres in depth. As seen on the previous site map, there are a variety of ring groove features suggesting Bronze Age activ activity. Unfortunately, none of these provided any dating or domestic evidence. However, it is parallel paralleled across multiple sites across Scotland. Many were heavily truncated, except for in one area around Structure 1. It consisted of irregular curving linears and pits forming a rough circular shape, and likely indicates at least one phase of uh, roundhouse activity. A possible barrow, structure 4, was recorded along the eastern boundary of the site, measuring 4.45 metres in diameter externally and internal dimensions of 2.45 by 2.15, with widths of 0.82 to 1.15 metres in depth. Unfortunately, the only body associated with this was a modern sheep burial, and that had been partially cut into the ditch. So its date so far is undetermined, however it could form part of Bronze Age funerary practice in the area or even be early historic in date. Future radiocarbon dating will hopefully answer this. The large linears measuring around 162 to 200 metres in length on a southeast northwest alignment are likely medieval or post-medieval in date and are likely field boundaries. They're possibly associated with sub-rectangular longhouse-like structures, structures two, three and five, towards the north. These features have loosely been paralleled to structures found at New Barns and Angus. Initially interpreted as Neolithic mortuary enclosures, radiocarbon dates at New Barns came back as early historic and put them in parallel with the Pitcarmic house found in Perthshire. However, until we get 
dates back, this is fairly open to change. The final main feature of the very north was a sub-oval enclosure measuring 25 metres by 19 metres. Of unknown date, however, it's been suggested to be possibly Iron Age and early historic in date. During the early stages of the excavation, there were around two or three features that stood from the general fare of the remainder of the site. The first one was a stone-lined pit that had no obvious associations other than with another faint pit, while the other was a large stone-filled pit amongst the early historic structures. Given the beachhead nature of the site and general lack of stone across the remainder of the area, these stood out as being particularly abnormal. It was these features that turned into the first of several kests across the northern portion of the site and are the focus of this presentation. Each kest was carefully excavated, hand-drawn, and photog photogrammetry models taken. We are deemed reasonable, pollen samples were taken from bases and around the skeletal remains of the kests and bulk samples were possible. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are still in the midst of our post-excavation programme, and so what follows will mostly be details of the kests themselves. However, this should give, should give good indication of the potential significance of the site and its future research potential. Kist 1, located in the western portion of the site, on a southwest northeast orientation, consisted of large sub-rounded boulders with cobbled angular flat stones across the southern border. Internally, the kist measured 1.05 by half a metre by 0.45. The kist was immediately visible from the stripped ground surface, however had no capstone and was filled with what appeared to be natural sand. Interred within was a poorly preserved set of remains. Skeleton 748 was a crouched inhumation, from what could have been seen anyway, and the head placed to the south, facing north, along with the remnants of a femur, fibula and tibia of the right leg. At what would have been at the base of 748's back was a small pile of teeth. The teeth were loosely bundled together and appeared to be a mix of both cremated and uncremated, and mainly consisted of the molar caps. The loose bounding of these suggests that they were perhaps in a small bag, and contained at the back of the remains, possibly acting as a grave good. The remains have been tentatively identified as a juvenile or young adult, perhaps explaining why the kist is one of the smallest on the site. To the west of kist 1 lay kist 2. It was buried into a large pit measuring 2.2 metres by 1.8 metres and laid in a, a north-south alignment. Kist 2 consisted of a mixed sandstone slabs and partial capstone remaining. Like Kist 1, it was infilled with a mixed natural sand. Kist 2 appeared to have been previously disturbed and only had a small portion of heavily degraded fragmented bone and some ceramic recovered. Based on what few remains were recovered, however, it seems that there was a juvenile in this Kist. Kist 3 was located uh, within one of the footprints of the subrectangular structures. The kiss was within a large, steep-sided pit measuring 2.2 metres by 1.88 by 1.2 metres in depth. The upper fill of the pit comprised of a large sub-angular stones, perhaps suggesting a cairn at one point mark marking its location. Kiss 3 was capped with two large flattened stones resting on the uprights of the large slabs with rounded edges. The kiss was on a southwest northeast orientation. Like the previous kiss, the interior was filled with brown gravelly sand overlaying sterile sand. Initially, this was interpreted as a natural infill due to weakness in the capstones. However, it is now more likely that this was a purposeful act. This has been explored by Fraser Hunter at the Kiss Cemetery at Westwater Reservoir at West Linton. Laying within Kiss 3 was a heavily degraded remains of what was likely to be an individual, individual skeleton 918. The body was crouched, the head was southwest and the skull the western corner of the facing south. Only the skull and legs survived particularly well. The remains of a body stain was also visible in part. So far, analysis has tentatively identified skeleton 918 as male. Another large pit measuring 2 metres by 1.24 metres and on a southwest northeast alignment and contained Kist 4. Lying at the northeast of Kist 3, this pit was similar steep profile, a large presence of stone, once again suggesting the cairn perhaps marked by a Kist by a cairn. 
capped with large shattered sandstone schist with upright of red sandstone to the east and the west grey sandstone to the north. The, south, the southern end had no uprights but rather was comprised of compacted sand and capped with medium rounded stones. KISS 4 also appeared to have been purposely infilled with light brown natural sand. The crouched inhumation of skeleton 1208 was lain within. The head was laid to the southeast and was facing south. Located beside the head, located beside the head was a poorly preserved ceramic vessel. Sadly, KISS 4 was one of the poorest preserved KISS, with some fragments of leg and arm recovered. So far, analysis has suggested that this individual to be a mature male. North of KISS 4 were KISS 5 and 6. Both KISS had been backfilled with natural sand and making the cuts for the pits particularly hard to spot. But some opportune weather and the discovery of the previous large pit that did indeed contain KISS 4 allowed us to spot them. KISS 5 sat in a large pit measuring 2.21 metres by 1.68 by 0.8 metres in depth and was filled with the natural sand and occasional quartz pebbles. The KISS was comprised of large red sandstone slab for capping stone laying over green sandstone schist and was orientated on a northeast southwest alignment. The main individual, skeleton 1158, was laying on their left side with a head to the east facing south. They were tightly bounded and had degraded remains of a possible oxide covering them, possibly part of a shroud. Textile was also recovered from the femur of 1158, as well as a bone woggle a belt fitting that would have been similar to what the scouts wear as neckties. Cremated remains lying to the southeast of skeleton 1158's knee and disarticulated juvenile, juvenile remains were also recovered. Heavily degraded but mostly intact food vessel was, with incised decoration was located just northeast of the main inhumation skull. All this was laying on tightly packed quartz pebble bases. So far, analysis has indicated at least one adult two juveniles and possibly even an infant are represented within this kist. Immediately southwest of kist 5, another large pit was uncovered with similar dimensions, fill and orientation, making it again incredibly hard to spot at first. Kist 6 was located at around one metre in depth and comprised of a large red sandstone slab broken slightly at one end, allowing for later infill of the part of the kist. The kist uprights were once again sandstone schist with longer off-kilter long slabs. At least two of the individuals recovered from kist 6, skeleton 1167, was in the southwestern half, while skeleton 1166 was in the northeastern. Both remains were well preserved and had some organic material remaining, possible evidence of another shroud. The remains of a heavily crushed and degraded beaker were recovered along with another bone woggle from around skeleton 1166. It is unclear whether the beaker was crushed through natural degradation of the kist or is due to one of these individuals being late, a later interment. The remains so far have been identified as an adult female with mild degenerative disease of the lower back and the others so far been identified as male. Initially masked by a modern Broadrig, KISS 7 was once again found at the base of a large pit, measuring 2.2 by 2.1 by 2 metres in depth. Filled again by redeposited sand and containing occasional quartz pebbles, KISS 7 comprised of mixed sandstone and conglomerate beachstone. Inside was another voided kist with fully articulated crouched inhumation, skeleton 1299. 1299 was laid in an east-west orientation with a head laid to the east and looking south. The body was laying on an organic deposit, possibly leaves or flowers. At the base of the left arm was a small copper alloy blade with three small pinholes. It was encased in a black organic substance, possibly a sheath or remains of a wooden handle. Analysis has so far identified 1299 as an adult male. Due to the nature of the kiss burials, mainly the number we had discovered that had shown no obvious surface cut, until the perfect conditions, AOC's geophysics department conducted a magnetometry and resistivity survey of the stripped area. This produced some 30 anomalies across the site, 
all of which were tested to depths that would we, have, we have, would have expected to have encountered a cast. Perhaps fortunately, only one of these anomalies turned out to actually be one. KIST-8 was located between KIST-5 and 7 in a much shallower pit measuring 1.2 by 0.75 by 0.6 metres. Capped with a heavily degraded sandstone cap that allowed for some later infill of the KIST beneath the infill. Beneath this infill was a layer of sterile sand covering skeleton 1333. 1333 was a heavily degraded crouched inhumation with only legs, pelvis and skull surviving. The inhumation was laid on the right side with the skull in the northwest corner looking south. Found along the sparse remains was a stout decorated ceramic beaker on its side. It was located to the base of the back of the remains. The underside of the vessel had degraded due to the weight of the sandy infill. However, despite that this was recovered fairly intact. The base of Kist 8 consisted of loosely packed quartz and mixed pebbles with a light surviving body stain beneath the skull and legs, perhaps again indicating floral tributes. Skeleton 1333 has so far been identified as an adult female. As I've previously mentioned, we are still at the early stages of our post-excavation programme. Due to the vol volume of skeletal remains and their national significance, this will be a long process. There is unfortunately little I can inform you with at present. However, I will give a brief overview, overview of our aims and how we hope to, this fits into the wider, wider Bronze Age burial activity. Our focus is primarily on the KISS. However, we'll be aiming to establish chronology of the site as a whole, aiming to to aid interpretation of what the remaining features I've briefly discussed, discussed at the beginning. With respect to the KISS, initial assessments are taking place to the skeletal remains where possible as we speak. This has revealed that there has been a predominance of males represented in the cemetery, though there are at least two females present. All estimates previously given are tentative, however, and awaiting further verification. We also have a variety of ages, from young juveniles of six and a half years, based on their dental eruption, to mature adults, aged over 45 years and possibly even some infants. We also have evidence of trauma to those interred, which including fractures on their forearms, cut marks appearing in the skull of one of our individuals as well. The cut marks observed so far happened long before death. These early insights are just the beginning of building a picture of life and death in Bronze Age society in this region. Other aims are to put these kists in a chronology. While they are similar construction, there are slight variations perhaps suggesting temporal differences in the cemetery's use. It's hoped that DNA analysis will allow us to investigate familial groups within the cemetery, and particularly allow us a rare chance to invest investigate the archaeology of children in the past. What is interesting so far is that those identified as sole juveniles are set a distance from the adult kiss. Could this be down to cemetery curation or just happenstance? Just along with the isotope, this along with isotope analysis will allow us to see whether there are incoming practices occurring or whether this is just local custom at play. Detailed sampling was taken across the site. This has allowed for specialist analysis such as pollen analysis and soil micromorphology. From this hope, we hope to shed light on potential evidence of floral tri tributes buried with the remains as seen at the Fortiviate burial in Persia. While approximately there are approximately 120 beaker burials recorded in the North East Scotland as of 2019. Very few have been recorded along the Firth of Tay so far. The Kiss at Carnoustie have significantly added to this corpus and will hopefully provide further insight to Bronze Age burial practices. The excellent preservation of organics and textile perhaps allows us to see what normative practices during the Bronze Age, as suggested by Olivia Leelong, and similar remains found at Langwell Farm in Strathoichel. So far, in the immediate area, similar examples, such as at the mains of Melgund, where a short kist with an adult male and juvenile were recorded. They were buried with a food vessel and dated to around the early Bronze Age. Examples of previously unreported kists by Taylor et al. showed concentration of the kist to the north of Angus, many with similarities to the ones found here. Further analysis has hopefully begun to pick out regional differences. And the inclusion of multiple inhumations is certainly not an unusual one. There is a growing number of cases across Scotland indicating that this was normal practice. Some excavations, such as at Kelso, found that some of these later inhumations were in fact centuries apart. So there's an interesting note that these are in the 
Carnoustie. Nah. So it will be interesting to note if these burials at Carnoustie mirror this. It cannot be understated that the findings at Pitskelly have been an exciting opportunity to understand Bronze Age activity in this area of Angus. The rare opportunity to, to investigate the funerary activity of multiple ages and perhaps even familial groups from the Bronze Age will significantly, significantly add to the corpus of data. It is unfortunate that at this stage I cannot shed more light on what we have uncovered. However, as we progress with the post-excavation programme, there will hopefully be further opportunity for me to share this information gleaned. Until then, thank you for listening.